All right, here we are. This is going to be a first trimester exam grammar review for the English 10A1 course. Um, if you see that shortened URL on this slide right here, that will lead you to the um, PDF worksheet. You can download that and you can work that out before you come to this video, or you can do it along with me, or however you want to go about doing it, but I will be working from that as my text. Um, that's a collection of exercises that were taken from old tests old trimesters, old comps, um, worksheets, quizzes, just different things that matched the style and format for the exam. So what you're going to see very closely mirrors what you'll see on the first trimester exam. Um, and I will offer explanations as well as the answers uh, so that hopefully those points that maybe have eluded you in the past will be clearer now and hopefully will um, let you do better on this test. So let's get into it. All right, the first section in the grammar. Um, on this test is going to be parts of speech and parts of speech will be formatted as you see it here. Uh, you're going to have a sentence, you're going to have an underlined word and you will identify what that underlined word's part of speech is in the sentence you see. So let's dive right in. Wow, that is a loud concert. Wow in this case is an interjection. Just to remind you the definition of that term, an interjection is a word that shows emotion. It does not have any grammatical relationship to anything else in the sentence. So, wow does not denote a person, place, thing, or idea. It is not a modifier. It does not convey action. It doesn't do anything. It just expresses emotion. Wow. Uh, words like, oh, well, uh, ouch, yikes, things like that, all interjections. Did Mary know anyone at the play? Uh, anyone is a pronoun. In fact, if we were going to be more specific, we would call this an indefinite pronoun. It points at someone or something not specifically known or named. Um, other indefinite pronouns would be stuff like nobody, or something, or each. Um, there are also personal pronouns, interrogative pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, reflexive and intensive pronouns, lots of different pronouns to talk about. You should always tell the truth. Always here acts as an adverb. A reminder, adverbs answer questions like how, when, where, uh, why, to what extent, under what condition. Those are all adverb questions. In this case, always tells us when. When should you tell the truth? Should tell is your verb phrase. You should always tell the truth. Um, so it's modifying the verb phrase, which is one of the things that adverbs modify, and it's telling you when. Adverbs modify verbs, adjectives, or other adverbs. My entire weekend was spent studying for finals. Entire is an adjective here, right? Adjectives tell you which one, what kind, um, or how many. Or how much you have of something. Uh, how much of my weekend? My entire weekend. It's modifying the noun weekend. I wish I was able to go away, but I have to save more money. But is used as a conjunction here. This is what we call a um, coordinating conjunction. Coordinating conjunctions are used with a comma and join together independent clauses. The coordinating conjunctions are known as fanboys. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. There are also uh, conjunctions called correlative conjunctions that work in pairs. You have things like not only, but also, um, uh, either or, neither nor, things like that are called correlative conjunctions. The bird flew into the tree. Flew is a verb, an action verb, conveys activity. My favorite color is pink, right? Um, that would again be an adjective. What kind of color? Your favorite color. And then John runs every morning before work. Runs is again a verb, just like you had in number 51 there. Um... Parts of speech are not covered here. Nouns, I think that's pretty obvious. A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. Um, and then preposition. Just to briefly talk about that, prepositions introduce a relationship between a noun and some other word in the sentence. Preposition, if you look at that word, you'll see position in there. Prepositions usually convey location or position or time. So prepositions are things like above, below, beneath, alongside, next to. Um, or they can be time words like before, after, since, during, in the middle of, things like that. So that should cover parts of speech very quickly. Um, let's move on to our next section. Our next section uh, happens to be parts of the sentence. Very roughly, you could divide these into subject and predicate, but here we're kind of more um, looking in more detail at simple subjects. And then in predicate, we would deal with the verb. Um, or things that complete the meaning of the verb called complements. And of these, there are two kinds. There are complements that follow action verbs, and we call those objects, direct and indirect objects. And there are subject complements that follow linking verbs. Um, we call those predicate nominatives or predicate adjectives. So let's see what we have. 
Have you ever visited a country fair? The first thing you should do in a sentence like this is rewrite it in natural order. You have ever visited a country fair. Um, you is the subject. Have visited is the verb. Ever is an adverb modifying that. You visited what? You visited a country fair. So um, this is a sentence with an action verb, visited. And you're saying visited what? Or visited whom? In this case, what? A country fair is the direct object. It receives that action of the visiting. Certain animals can be good pets, all right? So can be, you have a linking verb here, and this is a case where we have something called a predicate nominative. Pets is a noun. Nouns after linking verbs rename the subject. So animals is the subject. Another name for an animal could be a pet. You could call an animal a pet. So since it's a noun renaming the subject after a linking verb, we call that a predicate nominative. Mary gave me tickets to see my favorite band. All right, Mary is our subject. Gave is a verb. It's an action verb. Mary gave what? Mary gave tickets. Tickets would be our direct object, but we want to know what me is. So she gave them to me. That makes me the indirect object. Indirect objects answer to whom or for whom an action of the verb is done. So gave the tickets to me. Notice the, um, the order of that. Mary, subject. Gave, verb. Me, indirect object. Tickets direct object. That is how it will be in English. When you have an indirect object, it will always come between the verb and the direct object. The students asked many questions. All right, asked is an action verb. Yard work can be tiresome. All right, now can be. Notice how can be was the verb in 58 and can be is the verb in 55. Same thing. You have a linking verb here. But instead of a noun that renames the subject, now you have an adjective that describes the subject. And we call that a predicate adjective, an adjective following a linking verb that relates back to the subject. So yard work, we could describe that with the adjective tiresome. There was only one problem with your idea. Now, interestingly, this is something to talk about here, words like here and there are never subjects. Here and there are called expletives, they're placeholders. So whenever you say here is, or, or here are, or there was, or there were, or things like that, um, those are never, here and there are never subjects. The subject actually follows the verb, the state of being verb. So um, problem is actually the subject. It's what your sentence is about. Moving on here to phrases. There are many types of phrases we could talk about here. We're, we're uh, zeroing in on verbal phrases. Participles, gerunds, and infinitives would be considered verbal phrases because they're formed from verbs. And then a positive phrases, which are formed from nouns. Let's talk about the verbals quickly. Verbal phrases get their name because they're formed from, they're, they're based around a word that comes from a verb, but it's used in some other way. So a participial phrase is going to be an ing or ed form of a verb used as an adjective. A gerund is going to be the ing form of a verb used as a noun. An infinitive is two plus a verb form. So these are obviously all different things. Now, the participle and gerund may look alike. Participles and gerunds will um, be formed in a similar way. They both can end in ing. But gerunds are nouns and participles are adjectives, which means that you could remove a participial phrase from a sentence, and it'll still make sense, but you can't remove a gerund phrase from a sentence. Because it's a noun, it's doing some vital thing. It's playing some important role. So let's look at these. Hosting the Olympics in 1924, Paris impressed the world with its new stadium. All right. Hosting the Olympics in 1924. Hosting is clearly the ING form of a verb used in some other way here. And you ask yourself, what is hosting the Olympics in 1924 doing? It's describing, it's telling us more about Paris. And since Paris is a noun, and it's describing a noun, we call that an adjective. So this would be a participial phrase, the ING form of a verb used as an adjective. Preparing for these games took several years and millions of dollars. Preparing for these games, again, ing form of a verb, but in this case, it's used as a noun. It's the subject of the sentence. Why do I know that? Well, if I say took several years and millions of dollars, you ask yourself the question, who or what? What took several years preparing for these games? So that phrase is your subject. Even though hosting the Olympics in 1924 and preparing for these games look kind of similar, they're both starting with the ing form of a verb, they're acting differently, and that's what's important. Hosting the Olympics in 1924 is a modifier. Preparing for these games is a noun. And that's important to grasp, the difference between participle and infinitive. If I dropped 
that phrase in number 11. If I just said Paris impressed the world with its new stadium, I have a perfectly logical sentence. There's no problem. If I dropped preparing for these games, I have a fragment. It doesn't make sense. So gerunds, you have to keep participles you can dump. All right. New technology and ideas of urban planning helped the rebuilding of the city after World War I. Helped what? Helped the rebuilding of the city. That's um, acting as a direct object, so it's a noun. Therefore, again, we say gerund. Modernizing a city as old as Paris was no easy task. What was no easy task? Modernizing a city. Again, it's the subject, also gerund. So three gerunds in a row here. Notice how they are essential to understanding the sentence that they're in. Understanding what they do now, historians credit Hausman with shaping the history of the city in a way few other men could. Right? Now, this is the key word here. They credit Hausman with something. That thing is shaping the history of the city in a way few other men could. That is a noun because this acts as the object of a preposition. One of the things that a gerund phrase can do is act as the object of a preposition. Prepositions need objects. Without them, they don't make any sense. So this is necessary. It's a gerund phrase. The great novelist Marcel Proust was one of the first to understand Hausmann's greatness. As soon as you see two plus a verb form, you know that's an infinitive, right? To understand is an infinitive, and then Hausmann's greatness goes along with that. It completes the meaning. Proust lived through much of Hausmann's reconstruction in apartments designed for the upper classes. Now, here you have the ED form of the verb. Notice how it's designed, not designing, designed. When you see the ED form of a verb, you know you're dealing with a participle, right? Uh, designed for the upper classes describes the apartments. What kind of apartments are there? They are apartments designed for the upper classes. Proust, France's greatest novelist of the last 200 years, conceived and wrote an enormous novel that took 14 years and seven volumes to complete. Okay, your phrase here, France's greatest novelist the last 20 years, it's really based around the word novelist. It's based around a noun, and it tells you more about this guy, Proust. That's what makes it an appositive. Appositives are nouns or noun phrases that sit next to another noun and tell you more about it. So if I said something like, my English teacher, Mr. Frank, or if I said something like, um, Barack Obama, President of the United States, those are examples of nouns followed by appositives. Right? So Proust, France's greatest novelist the last 200 years, you know you have an appositive phrase. It's a noun telling you more about the previous noun. Embracing hundreds of characters, the semi-autobiographical novel sprawls over 3,000 pages and 1.5 million words and was rejected by many publishers because of the enormity of its scope. All right. Number 19 here should remind you of number 11. They're the exact same form, and therefore they're the exact same type of phrase. Embracing hundreds of characters describes this semi-autobiographical novel and therefore it is a participial phrase, right? And notice that when participial phrases start the sentence, they have to modify the subject. Believe it or not, and you have no way of knowing this, but I'm not lying to you, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now that says, participial phrases that begin the sentence must modify the subject. It was given to me by a student. Uh, actually, let's give credit where credit's due. She's a senior, Sierra Hawthorne. You can tell Sierra she got a mention in the video. Uh, and I'm wearing that right now because it's true. When a participial phrase begins a sentence, it must modify the grammatical subject. Will you ever know if I'm lying to you? You won't, but trust me, I'm actually telling you the truth. I'm wearing that shirt right now. To work on such a huge project took a tremendous toll on the author. Again, to work, as soon as you see two plus a verb form, you know you're dealing with an infinitive. All right, so that's phrases. Now we're dealing with clauses. Clauses are groups of words that, unlike phrases, have their own subject and verb. So therefore, um, in some cases, clauses stand on their own as sentences, but here we're dealing with what we call subordinate clauses, clauses that need something else to make their meaning clear. And subordinate clauses can act as adjectives, they can act as adverbs, they can act as nouns. Let's get into it. Whitewater rafting is a sport that you might enjoy. Okay, so we have these things called relative pronouns. Relative pronouns are that, which, who, whom, or whose. Just those words. They begin what are called adjective clauses, and relative pronouns begin adjective clauses because they refer to the word immediately before it. So adjective clauses are nice and simple. That you might enjoy describes sport. And in fact, every single adjective clause describes the word immediately before it. Which means you're never going to have an adjective clause start the sentence. That's nice. And it also means that you're looking for words like that, which, who, whom, or whose. That's simple. And it means that you're always going to be next to a noun so that you can describe that noun. So adjective clauses have a very particular look and feel. And um, they're pretty predictable. Um, that Marie Curie changed modern science is well known. 
Okay. Now notice we began the sentence with that. Um, so it can't be an adjective clause. What is it? Is it adverb or is it noun? Well, if I take it out and I have is well known, I really don't have much of a thought, do I? So this has got to be a noun clause. This has got to be the subject of the sentence. Right? That Marie Curie changed modern science is well known. That Marie Curie changed modern science is my adjective, uh, sorry, my noun clause acting as a subject. Okay. As the Titanic was sinking, the musicians continued to play. All right. Fortunately for us, this is an adverb clause and has all the look of an adverb clause. Adverb clauses will sometimes start the sentence, and when they do, they're always followed by a comma. That's good to know. Secondly, adverb clauses begin with things called subordinating conjunctions. As is a good subordinating conjunction. Um, a lot of subordinating conjunctions, since they're adverb clauses, answer adverb questions, like when. When did they continue to play? They continued to play as the Titanic was sinking. So words like before, after, during, when, because, uh, so that, are all good subordinating conjunctions that tell you you're dealing with an adverb clause. That was the year when they buried the time capsule. Right? Now, actually kind of a tricky thing here. Um, this is sort of one of those exceptions to the rule. Um, the word when here normally makes you think about adverb, but there is such a thing as a, a relative adverb, just like there's a relative pronoun. And in this case, when they buried the time capsule is an example of one of those relative adverbs that begin adjective clauses. Um, what year am I talking about? I'm talking about the year when they buried the time capsule. So this is an adjective clause. You don't see those as often, but they do, they do creep up on you. So you need to pay attention to what are called relative adverbs. Um, when and where would probably be your most common relative adverbs. How would you know it's a relative adverb starting an adjective clause and not an adverb clause? Well, it's describing a noun. So if you're describing a word like year, you're describing a noun, we call that an adjective. I believe that their new address is on Summer Street. I believe what? What do I believe? I believe that their new address is on Summer Street. That's a direct object, so direct objects have to be nouns. Dad and I hid the gift so that we could surprise my sister. Why did we hide it? Or under what condition did we hide it? Um, so that, there's your subordinating conjunction, so that we could surprise my sister, and that's an adverb clause. Um, so that we could surprise my sister describes hid, describes the verb. Now lastly, we have some agreement. Agreement is of two kinds, and we have both kinds here. Subject verb agreement and pronoun antecedent agreement. This is where you deal with topics like indefinite pronouns, compounds, collectives, numbers, fractions, percentages, um, and other kinds of exceptions to the rule. So let's talk about this. Um, I think 70% of the votes is or are going to be in her favor. Well, 70%, that is my subject of this verb. 70% could refer to a singular or to a plural. So this is one of those cases where you actually have to look at the object of the preposition. You don't always have to do this, but in this case, we're going to say are because votes is plural. Neither of the girls was at the game. Neither is always singular. Doesn't matter that it's girls. Neither is an indefinite pronoun is always singular. Neither Jim nor Matt is in school today. When two singular things are joined by or or nor, they stay singular. Jim is singular, Matt is singular, so we say is. Many of the boys have been playing soccer since childhood. Many, as an indefinite pronoun, is one of the four that are always plural. Both, few, many, and several are always plural. Some of the paper has been completed. Now, some is your subject. There are six indefinite pronouns that could be singular or plural. All, any, more, most, none, or some. In those cases, you have to look at the object of the prep phrase. Paper is singular, so we go with has. All of the dinner rolls were eaten. I just said, six indefinite pronouns. All, any, more, most, none, or some. So all of the rolls. Rolls is plural, so we say were eaten. Six weeks is a long vacation. Time is tricky. Time and, and, and dollar amounts and things like that are generally going to be singular. And in this case, it's singular because six weeks is a long vacation. We're talking about it like one big unit of time, like you took six weeks off. So you'd say it, it is a long time or it was a long time. Pronoun antecedent agreement. My cousins brought their water shoes to the park. That's very simple. Cousins is plural. We don't have to worry about gender when we're in plural, so that's fine. 
Max or Simon will bring his dessert to the party. Max or Simon, again, I said this before, two singulars joined by or or nor stay singular. Since Max and Simon are both masculine, we can get away with just using his. If it was Max or Sheila, uh, we would say we'll bring his or her dessert to the party, which might be a little more cumbersome, but that's what's correct. The car that had its headlights on all night would no longer start. Car is singular, so we say its. Few of the boys had time to eat their lunch. Few is, again, one of the four indefinite pronouns that's always plural. Both, few, many, several. Nearly one-fifth of the players received their trophy. Right? One-fifth could be singular or plural, but since it's players, I'm dealing with a plural. Neither of the girls brought her books home. Neither is always singular. So that is a quick rundown of the grammar you're going to see on the trimester exam. I hope this was helpful. And uh, good luck.